And um, you've been doing no-till on your farm since 1994 outside Winterton. What was your motivation for, for you know, investing and converting conventional tillage to no-till? The main thing that started us off was that we weren't making money and we realized that we had to do, we had to change something or find out why the reason we were we weren't making money. And we thought that having read all about the American Dust Bowl, there might have been something there. And my actual school education we had at a, uh, um, where was that at Western? At, at Western. Yeah. Okay. At Western, we had a, a master there who was very, very keen on soil structure and soil conservation, and that's where the seeds were. Who was that master? Donald Patterson. Uh, Donald Patterson. Okay. Yeah. He was there. That was right down in 1956, 57, 58. Okay. Yeah, and we were already on the. In fact, I've got his, you know, his book, The Plowman's Folly, which he gave me um, about 10 years ago, that his dad had given to him when he came back from up north. And when I gave him the first no-till guide, he gave me his Plowman's Folly, which was explaining exactly what happened in the, in the Dust Bowl. The American Dust Bowl. And that was in 19? That's the 1930s. So okay. Right and it was horrifying. The whole of America nearly came to its knees. And it was the strongest nation in the world. And why did that dust ball occur? Because they, did, they uh, misused their topsoil. Okay. They lost all their topsoil, all their erosion. All their uh, topsoil is eroded away by wind and water. And uh, was that because there was no organic matter in that soil? As soon as you open up the, your soil, in goes air, oxygen, and straightaway decomposition t starts taking place. All your organic material is then decomposed, and out goes CO2. And uh, that is the carbon dioxide, and that is the beginning of your soil being just sad. You lose okay. all, all the life in your soil. All the and that had quite a profound sort of impact on your thinking. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, the whole way. I knew. I knew the whole time that it was the organic matter content in the soil that was dropping, or the carbon content, whatever you want to call it. And once that drops, your soil can't find it, can't hold itself, it blows away, water can't penetrate into it, its temperatures, it absorbs temperature far uh, higher than uh, soil that's uh, got a high, or the correct uh, humus content. And and your 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 farm soils were heading that direction. Our you farm felt soils were they, they were very much like that down in the end of the 60s and 70s. We'd already flogged them. They were so sandy that you could actually not turn a tractor's wheels if you were going. If you turn the tractor to turn right, it just bulldozed, just graded that that uh, soil in front of it. It wouldn't bite into turn anymore. Okay, so, and that was mainly from conventional tillage practices years and years. Well, in those days, the main thing was the soil to seed contact because you couldn't grow a crop without a mealy. Uh -huh. So you had to get a very good uh, plant population. But to get a good plant population, you had to have a, a good soil to seed contact. And if you could keep your crop your land clean for six weeks without any growth on it, you never had a cutworm problem. Okay. So all these things were stacked against us going for, for conservation tillage. Okay. Until long came Roundup, and that was uh, opening up to the world of conservation agriculture. And uh, how, how did Roundup sort of facilitate uh, conservation agriculture? Well, if you can use Roundup, you can leave your plants to your weeds, your cover crop, your anything to keep binding the soil. Then you can kill it and leave it in situ. Okay. And it'll say all those plant uh, roots and everything will be there to bind the, the soil and hold it together, increase the humus content. You can kill it off and then you can just plant straight through that um, uh, seed bed 
with all the uh, weeds. Uh, Once you've sprayed it with Roundup and, and killed killed it off. Killed it off. But okay. the, all the stuff you sprayed stays in situ. You haven't turned it in. You haven't broken the soil. Okay. The place where you break the soil is where your seed goes in. And what have you found um, in your experience since you started with no-till? What have the improvements been on your farming business? Oh, on the farming business. Well, we never made any money anyhow. No, we made a hell of a lot more money than we did there. Okay. The one thing that interested me very, very much. Yes. Dust. I've got really going in properly in the dust in 1980 uh, with uh, my watch for it, with my no But uh, we had the old machinery uh, planted and things. But we got going. Yes. Not like we said in 94 when we really got the modern machine. Yes. Around about the 80s, I bought my first Fiat South tractor. The tractor is still running today. It's perfect. It had one set of rings. It's built two massive big dams, and I used three tractors to build three, uh, two massive big dams. The following year, I bought a Fiat 1180, which is an 82 kilowatt machine. Today, that tractor does all my planting and everything, and the engine, the gearbox, and everything touch has never been touched from then till now. Is that is that obviously um, regular maintenance? But is, is that because no till um, no tilling puts a lot less strain on the engine? No. Uh, yeah, you're not using the, the, the full amount, the same amount of power. Okay. But it's dust. It's dirt. Okay. That you're working under clean conditions all the time. Uh, Where we used to change our uh, the air filters and things sometimes with oil bath air filters, we used to change them twice in really August wind conditions when we were having to work and it was dust and you couldn't see the driver. You only saw him there because of his white teeth that stuck out. <laughs> you had dust. Dust, dust, dust. You're changing the air, the oil bath cleaners twice a day, and uh, you were fighting against your grinding paste all the time. You came in with a no till, you worked the whole day, and you can blow your nose and you haven't got any dust in your nose. <laughs> and uh, water, yeah, tell me about the benefits of water conservation or moisture conservation when you since you've been using no-till? Well, number one is your infiltration is 100% better than unconventional soil. When you have a clean seed bed and you've got bare soil, you get the raindrop coming down and that little raindrop has a lot of energy in it. When it strikes the soil, it seals it, and you've got thousands of little hammers. Within five minutes in a heavy storm, that is compacted that top. And before it can go in again, it's got to wash that top off. So it washes it off. A little bit of uh, rain goes in, uh, water goes in. By that time, it's recompacted it. So the next layer, and it's an ongoing process that very few people understand. But as long as it's raining on a, on a clean surface, land surface it is compacting that top and that water cannot infiltrate and erodes and then it, it erodes the top it soil it erodes it every five minutes it takes off a centimeter a centimeter um, uh, a millimeter or so of top soil. but that adds up but that adds up and on and on and on because five minutes later it's compacted it again so it washes that off before it can go in again and how does the no-till differ to that well, situation? Well, no-till, you've got the residue on the top. And that is just like a shock absorber in your motor car. When that raindrop comes down, all its energy, and it strikes a piece of grass or a piece of maize residue or something, it dissipates the energy and it just soaks into the ground. And that's, uh, uh, that's the whole trick behind no-till. You get the, all your water infiltrating okay. and once it's in there once the the the, the water infiltrates it's in the ground yes it's in the bank it stays there and and it yeah. won't evaporate very quickly i imagine no, as well because i don't know if you saw uh the, the thermometer the five degrees difference or six degrees difference in a 
clean soil and a soil that's covered. Wow. Okay. You know, nature did it that way. That it's always covered wherever you look, anywhere. In, yeah, the soil is always covered by some soil cover. Where, where man hasn't where man interfered. Hasn't opened it up. Yes. We couldn't do it before because we we can't we can't explain ourselves. If you ask yourself the question, uh, why did man first till the earth? Man first till the earth, not to make a seedbed for his uh, plant. He didn't make it to make a seedbed to put the plant in. He tilled the earth to stop the competition from the local vegetation. That is why he tilled. That's why we plowed and dirt and did everything before we had round them. Okay. We had to weed control, basically. weed control, bush control, anything. As soon as your plant is competing with the natural stuff, which I said earlier on, it was all put there by evolution. Wherever that soil was, evolution worked out what natural protection it would give to the soil. Now we take that away. Now we've got trouble. Now we can put it back the cover that we can use around it. And um, your fuel consumption uh, when you are using no-till um, and chemical applications, etc. How do they compare? Chemical applications, the cheapest thing on any farm is your weed killer. You can't, you can't put a price to weed killer. I'm going to tell you for double the price. <laughs> <laughs> uh, weed killer is a must. In no till. In no okay. You've, you've got to use your weed killer correctly. There are times that people don't, and farmers don't understand that the smaller you tack your weed, the better your control. If you do an autumn spray of Roundup, you are actually getting away with half a liter of Roundup and very little. Uh, spring spray because if you stop the weed there just before winter that's clean all your tops all your top germinating weeds are gone now when the rain comes they're not there to grow you, you just got the residue and the weeds can't because they don't come through for ages and ages okay and yields what have you noticed about yields with uh, compared good, to conventional tillage in a good season we are on a uh, 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 conventional and uh, no till are on a par. Okay. So they, they talk about this and that, but I don't think it's a five percent difference either way. Okay. But in a bad season, you can be up to seventy percent difference. In favour of no till. In favour of no till. Where and bad still, being perhaps dry conditions. Dry conditions. That's the main thing. Yeah. Okay. South Africa is. Known for dry conditions, it's not known for a good rainfall. Okay. So, on average, you must score by going to over 10 years, you'll most likely get a much higher percentage of bad seasons than you will in good seasons. But yes. if you can level out your graph and say we're in the middle all the time, then you're fine. But you are far better off than uh, conventional because you're going to get away. It doesn't mean to say that you're going to save your crop if you're in a bad, uh, very bad drought. It means that you, under no till you might get another three weeks or a month that your plant will stay alive, that you've got chance of getting another rain and saving that crop. A grace period. A grace such. period of, of, say, another month. You will be right at the end of your month. You're only going to get a 5% return. But if you're within 5% of this uh, of the drought beginning, you might get a 95% uh, return, better return. So. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, Ant. Uh, thanks very much for your time. And, um, yeah, we look forward to learning more from you in the years. Yeah. But another thing we mustn't forget to tell us. No-till is not only about crop production. No-till is about saving the soil from erosion. Infiltration is better. Temperatures are controlled.
great. Thank you, Anne.